Dateline, Roswell, New Mexico, June, July, 1947. Did a flying disc crash land on the Roswell Ranch in New Mexico back in the summer of 1947? Or was it a weather balloon as the US Army subsequently reported? Was there a biological alien on board the doomed craft? And has all this been the subject of a massive government cover-up? From Roswell to present day, the subject of UFOs, now known as UAPs or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, have captured headlines and the imagination of people from all over the world. But the scientific community remains largely skeptical and questions abound. Why and how, for example, would the government cover up perhaps the most significant discovery in the history of humankind? Why, if they lost a spacecraft and one of their citizens, would we have not heard from the alien civilization in question, perhaps trying to retrieve their property? And how is it that an alien civilization capable of crossing the unfathomable distances of interstellar space could have the technology to perform that feat and yet not have the ability to navigate our skies without crashing? And why is it that in an era of billions of high resolution cell phones, taking billions of photographs every day does photographic evidence of UAPs remain as rare and in poor quality as images dating back 50 or more years ago? Tonight on a particularly intriguing edition of SETI Talks, we're gonna explore these questions and more with two very special guests who may help shed some scientific light on this perplexing topic. I do think it's fair to say that to date, neither the federal government nor the scientific community have conducted any actual research on the topic of UAPs. And by research, I mean, conducting observational or other detection experiments specifically designed to detect, image, characterize, and otherwise understand the phenomena that have been so widely reported by accidental observation, but never verified. As the CEO of the SETI Institute, I personally advocate for such an undertaking, and we do have the technology to help. All we need is funding. And now, of course, you may have heard that Harvard's Avi Loeb is famously getting at least one such experiment underway. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and SETI Institute friends the world over. Thanks for joining us for tonight's SETI Talk, UAPs, are they worth scientific attention? For our regular SETI Talk attendees and new guests alike, let me remind you that if you're watching tonight on Zoom, you can post questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to at least some of those questions at the end of the panel discussion, hopefully as many as we possibly can. I also wanna remind you that we love to know where you're joining us from, as always, so please use the chat function to tell us where you are. Our host and moderator for tonight's discussion is the Institute's very own Molly Bentley, who is co-host and executive producer of our Big Picture Science podcast and radio program. Before I turn the podium over to Molly, I wanna let you know that SETI Talks is a production of the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California, and is made possible by the generous support of people like you. You can learn how to get involved in our mission, support our work, or sign up for newsletters online at SETI.org. Tonight's uh, talk is sponsored by Carl Cruz. Carl grew up in Puerto Rico and often visited the Arecibo Observatory there in visits that inspired his lifelong curiosity about space and what's out there. Although growing up in Puerto Rico, he attended college and graduate school in the US with degrees from Princeton, NYU, and Stanford University. And just to continue his global exploration, he now lives in Berlin, Germany. Carl's been a follower and supporter of the SETI Institute since taking a SETI course with Seth Shostak back in the 1990s. Unfortunately, Carl can't join us tonight from Berlin, but we thank him for making the program possible. And with that, let me toss the saucer over to Molly to launch tonight's program. Molly? <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by providing some additional context for tonight's conversation um, to further what, what Bill said. Science fiction seemed to become reality at the end of 2017 when the New York Times reported that a government had a secret UFO program. Now, it wasn't the first government UFO investigation. There had been a few in the 50s and in the 60s. And by the time that the public had heard about this one, it had been defunct for about five years. But the fact that the government did have a modern UFO program blew mental gaskets. Warp speed ahead. Now we're at 2020. The Department of Defense officially releases three Navy videos from its once classified program. The videos appear to show objects zipping through the sky, even rotating against the wind. And according to some Navy pilots, the objects are maneuvering in a way 
that no known aircraft can. And it was this year in 2020 that we learned that the government had created a new program to investigate these objects, but replaced the term UFO, unidentified flying object, with UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena. In June of that year, excuse me, in June of this year, the UAP task force released its preliminary report on the mysterious objects seen by military pilots. Of the 144 sightings, the Pentagon was able to explain one of them. It was a balloon. It could not identify the other 143 puzzling phenomena. Were they also balloons? What about birds or domestic or foreign aircraft? It could be camera errata or visitors from outer space. Our guests tonight would like to know, but they say that UAPs have not generated the kind of scientific interest that they deserve. Ravi, <clears throat> excuse me, Ravi Koparapu is a planetary scientist and an astrophysicist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. His studies include the potential habitability of Earth-like planets around other stars and atmospheric modeling using data from the Kepler Space Telescope. Welcome, Ravi. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> Jacob Hawk Mizra is a SETI astronomer and a senior research investigator at the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Among other things, he studies planetary habitability, atmospheric dynamics, and environmental ethics, and the big questions about the distribution and future of life in the universe. Together, they wrote an article in Scientific American. And oh, welcome, Jacob. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. <laughs> Moving on with the conversation. We're very happy that you are with us. Together, Jacob and Ravi wrote an article in Scientific American in 2020 and an op-ed in the Washington Post this year, making the case that UAPs are legitimate subjects for scientific study. So let's find out why they think so. Jacob, I'm going to start with you. The behavior of these objects is puzzling to say the least. Do any of the objects in these videos move in a way that make you say, holy cow, how could anything on earth move like that? Just so we can have an image in our minds as we proceed with this conversation. Could you select one of the objects um, in one of the videos and describe why its movement is so hard to explain? Sure, yeah, this is why these videos are so interesting. And so um, in, in uh, 2004, it was the USS Nimitz and encountered several objects and that's some of what's uh, captured in these videos. And so what's puzzling about these objects is their rapid movement. You see things like an object descending from 28,000 feet to sea level in less than a second. And, and so you know, if you try to estimate the acceleration on these kind of objects, you get anywhere from hundreds to thousands of times the force of gravity, which would, you know, not even, even our most trained pilots wouldn't be able to, to uh, survive this. Um, and the amount of energy required to have that kind of acceleration is just beyond the kind of technology that we have today. So just based on that alone, this is something that's, it's, if it's not violating the laws of physics, it's using physics in ways we don't know how to do yet. Mm -hmm. And these are very short videos, though, so we only get snippets of the behavior of these objects. There's short videos, uh, you know, there's some radar data, there's some eyewitness accounts. Uh, we'll get into the conversation more, but there's not enough data to say what they are yet. But there's enough snippets of data to make me say, hey, this is really interesting. And, and whatever it is, this is something about physics that we don't really understand yet. Okay, so that's making the case for why they, why maybe we should study in them. But Ravi, how do we know that these are physical objects and not just quirks of the instruments? I mean, these are really sophisticated instruments and they're highly, um, and they're designed for precise um, uh, uh, calculations on these, on, these, um, on these aircraft. How do we know that what we're seeing are not just quirks of the instruments? Right, um, I'm going to address this with two points. If we are talking about the recent Navy, uh, Navy incidents, it is certainly possible that some of these are instrumental artifacts. So the DNA report does mention that some of them could be the result of sensor array, uh, errors and uh, probably require additional rigorous analysis. But what we have seen in the public, like you, you know said, what, Ravi, I'm going to interrupt for a minute. I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm going to suggest maybe take off your, your head, your 
let's just go, maybe I would take it off. Uh, I mean, unplug it from the computer. Let's try that. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, let's take that from the top. Um, so you said, so my question was, how do we know that this, these aren't just errata in the, in, the, in the instrumentation? Right, so what I was saying is that if, if we really are talking about the recent Navy incidents, and it's certainly possible that these are instrumental artifacts, the DNI report, of course, does mention that there could be sensor, uh, sensor errors and require some more um, study and analysis. Uh, like you said, what we have seen is a snip, just snippets of data. However, these UAP are not a single type of object uh, to explain away that they are instrumental artifacts. Their appearances and behaviors indicate multiple type of UAPs, so may require different explanation. Th there is even more fundamental issue here. We are now caught up with this relatively recent news, UAP news. This phenomenon is not a new thing. It has been going on for decades. And if uh, Professor James McDonald in his uh, science and default document um, uh, has written about four cases, are all the events in the past and around the world that's happening uh, could be explained away by instrumental issues. I mean, while the recent events got understandably highlighted the UAP uh, uh, discussion, we should uh, remember the history. History is important to give us a context so that we can understand our own biases. Okay, we'll pause it before we get to too much of the history, but now you've made the case that um, while some of them may be glitches in, in the um, instruments, these seem to be physical objects. They seem to be, the events seem to be happening around the world. The two of you would like um, to study them more rigorously, but the objects have already been of study by, studied by the Pentagon. So for both of you, what more do you hope to learn and what can scientists do and the team of scientists that you would like to pull together, what can they do that hasn't already been done? Well, I would like to know what they are. And you know, this is the point we made in our, in our Washington Post article is that a lot of times these conversations focus on, um, well, they, they focus on what are they? And we wanna answer that question now. And, and I want to answer that question, but the real question we have to ask first is how can we understand what they are? And there's a large percentage of these objects that are seem to be objects in the sense that they appear on radar, there might be infrared camera observations, there might be uh, eyewitness sightings. Um, so multiple wavelengths, multiple you know point, pieces of data uh, indicating that it's an object. And, and a larger fraction of these are unexplained than we would usually um, accept in any other field of science. Mm -hmm. um, and so when there's that much to be, un to be explained, um, you know, do, do they all fall in the categories of birds or airplanes or weather balloons? If that's the case, we should understand why we have such a hard time identifying those things. Well, let's be clear, though, um, because I think there's no dispute that this, these objects are truly puzzling. But what is it that scientists could do that the Pentagon didn't already do? Because they went through all of this. They could answer some of them. They couldn't answer um, you know, they couldn't identify what some of the other objects were. What is it that your, your team, and you've been calling for an interdisciplinary team of scientists to study them, what could they do that the government wasn't able to do? Well, we, we don't have access to the government data. There's been very little data that's been declassified. Uh, there's various reasons for that. I would love for you know, data to be declassified, but you'd probably have to reveal in information about your instrument in order to make sense of the data. That instrument is probably very secret and, and you know, maybe it's good that we're not de declassifying that, but for, for better or for worse, we don't have access. I don't know what the Pentagon has done. They may have some secret report that will never be released. I am not an insider at all. All I know is that there's been enough information coming from the US government and then elsewhere beyond the US government to say that multiple governments and agencies and, and non-government actors all take this seriously and, and find observations. But what, we, what you would need if you want to get past this, this, this classified wall of data is to take your own independent data. You need to take you know, data at multiple wavelengths at uh, you know, infrared, take radio data, take optical, you know, record you know, with, with cameras. Um, you, know, you can use some of the global sensor networks that are already in place by agencies like NASA and others where the data is publicly disclosed mm -hmm. and then supplement that with you know anything that you can build if there's funding available to to really take continuous measurements not just you know 
sample the sky once per day, but you need to have continuous measurements of as much of the sky as you can, which fundamentally is similar to the problem SETI does. It's just you're looking at a different distance. Instead of trying to look far away for radio signals at the whole sky all the time, you want to look a little bit closer in, but still the whole sky at, at all the time, ideally, if you really mm -hmm. want to know what's there. Mm -hmm. And let, we'll come back to some of the, the methods that you may be using, but you've given us enough, um, a nice outline of, of how you might do that. But the key here is that you want to do an independent, you want to do independent investigation. So this isn't about trying to get access to um, the, the UAP task force report or look at it more carefully or try to get the, the Pentagon to give you information that they're not giving up, or even to go back to those initial videos. It sounds like you're talking about something where you gather the data on your own as an independent um, body of scientists. Is, is that right? And I, I would love to see what the Pentagon has, but I don't think we're going to get it. And I don't think it's worth barking up that tree. And you know, the Ravi can talk more about the historical cases. We should learn from what has been done because there is a lot of, of you know, just in terms of the methods and the questions that you ask. And but but we don't have data from those old cases either. We don't have enough mm -hmm. data to be able to really do any kind of assessment. So we need to collect new data. Mm -hmm. Well, Ravi's been talking about the history. Um, can you give us just an overview of how, if this is what you mean, how the past historical, um, let's see, investigations, and it could be anything from the Condon report to um, the government projects of Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book, I believe those were the names, um, the names shifted as, as time went on. Is that what you mean, Ravi? Is like look at how they did it in the past, and 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 get some guidance from those earlier investigations. Right. So there there were some um, reports written in the last fifty years, um, fifty years ago, uh, and and I would say some of the whatever the reports conclusions are, there was a scientific investigation, some sort of a scientific investigation are you was talking done. about the Condon report um, yeah. in the sixties, uh, late sixties. Right, uh, not just the Condon report. I'm also talking about the uh, well. The Condon report was the result and was the one that uh, came out in the late '60s that you know essentially said maybe it's not uh, UFOs are not uh, scientifically uh, what important to investigate or something like that. Uh, but I would say that the the lesson that we want to learn is there was actually something done about it, mm -hmm. and it was okay to talk about a scientific investigation to do. Uh, research on these uh, UAPs. Uh, uh, James McDonald uh, uh, disagreed with some of the results from the Condon report and tried to assess some of the cases that were discussed in the Condon report itself. And so, so you see that kind of debate is needed. We can't just say that, you know, let's not study them because whatever, they are instrumental artifacts. But this is the way science is done. Mm -hmm. Let's have a discussion on the science, how it is done, and then we will go ahead and see how uh, like Jacob is saying, collect the data and to see how and what we learn about them. Mm -hmm. Now, you've brought up something um, that I think is what's underpinning your argument for why it's important to study these. Um, and that has to do with the reason why we haven't studied these. So you said that there was a period of time when we were studying them and that wasn't a problem. But now there's a taboo around it. And at least that's my understanding from what you've written. I wonder if you, the two of you could address why studying this sort of phenomena of UFOs or UAPs has been considered taboo among scientists? And when did that happen? Because as you said, um, you know, maybe 50 years ago, it wasn't taboo. I'll let Jacob answer first and then I'll have a follow up with that. Okay, well, I mean, I think the, the obvious answer is it's guilt by association. Um, when you say UFO, People think of saucers and little green men and alien abductions and everything else. And, um, you know, very quickly, I'll tell you, I went, uh, you know, a couple of years ago before the pandemic to the Library of Congress. I went through Carl Sagan's files there uh, and he had several files on UFOs. Uh, mostly it was letters, about half of his letters people had written him. But then he collected, you know, various pieces of you know writing that interested him and there were you know crop circles were in there because at the time we didn't even know the answer to were crop circles a hoax or not or what caused that and so just being open-minded enough to to look at all that I thought it was interesting that that Sagan was just collecting all that data and and so um the fact that all of those topics are under even in Carl Sagan's file folders are all under UFO 
th that makes it really difficult to then focus on a very narrow set of anomalous objects in the sky that may sometimes be confused for airplanes or, or birds mm -hmm. or weather balloons, but has, you know, to decouple it from the, the other sort of paranormal other topics and maybe some topics that are even worthy of study, but, but have nothing to do with objects that are in the sky. And I think mm -hmm. that's really the problem is, is if, if you say UFOs, it assumes all of this pseudoscientific paranormal content mm -hmm. and and a lot of scientists just would rather distance themselves from that rather mm -hmm. than sort of implicate themselves in pseudoscience. And we should be clear that the crop circle mystery was cleared up and the guys came forward and and my my colleague Seth Shostak always liked to say why was it that those crop circles were always made like after 5 p.m. on Friday and on the weekend but anyway crop circles is not a mystery um, what what might be flying around our skies is and in fact um, the taboo around it is one of the reasons why the government changed the program from UFO study to UAP, because what they said was that if you could uh, reduce the stigma around it, you might get pilots coming forward more often and um, just admitting to what they saw. So the stigma also extends to the, to the, um, you know, the, the community of pilots as well. Um, on the, on the idea that this might be something else other than a craft. And I think that that's really important going into your investigations. Both of you have said, going into this investigation doesn't mean that you are looking for evidence of alien craft and, and you wanna you know, decouple that. And Robbie, you compare the study of UAPs to the initial study um, by scientists of astronomical phenomena like gamma ray bursts or supernovae or gravitational waves. They seem very different from what we're seeing in our skies, but what's the connection there? So I was uh, talking about the transient phenomena and the transient nature of these uh, uh, astronomical phenomena uh, and how scientists study them. Uh, and, and so there is a, there is a, a precedent about you know, how we do that, how we, with what kind of instruments, and how we collaborate, share data, you know, collect new data, publish, you know, the scientific process. So that is the context that I was talking about, you know, how do we study transient phenomena? Mm -hmm. The UAPs are transient, some of them, many of them are transient phenomena themselves. Mm -hmm. And so... Just to be clear, when you say you called for this, this is something you called for in, in some of your writing, I think in the, in the Washington Post or the, uh, the Scientific American article, that's what you mean. That's right. And transient, they're just very brief. And also some of these UAPs, they don't repeat. So you get one shot, right? Is that the one of the problem? Right, but but it's a class of phenomena that we need to observe, right? So just like, you know, a gamma ray burst or a supernova. So we, we know that it is a gamma ray burst or we know the nature of the astrophysical nature of these transient phenomena because we studied them. If I just see something, you know, a bright shiny object in the sky, uh, if an astronomer, and then, you know, I, I try not to share the data or I just try not to uh, study, but then make it a taboo to study that phenomena, we will never progress. We will never understand it. Maybe you, uh, when we study these UAPs, all UAPs may turn out to be mundane. Totally fine. Totally cool. Mm -hmm. But then let's do a scientific process to understand them. Mm -hmm. And so that we will know what they are rather than a speculation. Will you be disappointed if they're all balloons? I have no, no reason. No, not at all. <laughs> we, we, we have, what did you say? Our approach is agnostic, right? So we should be open to everything. If it's a balloon, that's great. Fine. It's a strange kind of balloon. Then I'll know something. <laughs> okay. Well, the two of you are calling for an interdisciplinary team, um, which means scientists from all different kinds of disciplines. What sort of disciplines do you want to include in this, in this team? Uh, so in this case, um, from what we have learned, at least the ones that we have seen, these appear to be mostly in the uh, Earth's atmosphere, atmospheric phenomena. So, so we should have, you know, aerospace um, uh, and aviation related people, uh, experts in this. Uh, we need probably meteorologists. Jacob is, of course, a meteorologist and his degree has a degree in meteorology. Uh, we should have phys physical scientists. Uh, to understand what is going on. Uh, so at least these uh, disciplines would be good to start with. I wouldn't say this is the comprehensive list, but these would be the, these uh, uh, 
uh, three or four uh, expert expertise would be really useful to start working on. And this would be around around the world, or that doesn't that doesn't matter. We, I mean, who if an expert is an expert, so if you want to, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Well, could you, the two of you give us a real sense of what these studies would look like? I mean, Jacob gave an overview, but are we talking about scientists for a discrete period of time um, setting up uh, observation stands or, or just pouring through data? Or how would you collect the information that you want to collect? For one, like you said, these phenomena are transient. So do you set up telescopes or infrared video or radar data collection collecting sites and and just wait or what, what would this look like um so something like that i would say uh, and uh, probably some fast tracking cameras because when we were talking about transient phenomena as well uh, and different spectral wavelengths uh, different wavelengths uh, some of them could be optical infrared uh, maybe in the uv maybe in the long uh, far infrared and even in the radio would be good uh, i would but Will you tell us why? Will you just tell us why it's so important to get all those different wavelengths? Right. So radar, I would probably maybe because uh, we can potentially get, uh, obtain some sort of a, a speed or um, uh, the range uh, for these uh, some of these objects. Uh, infrared because to see if they are emitting any you know thermal radiation heat. Mm -hmm. uh, optical just just because to see what, how. Uh, you know they operate in the visual band, mm -hmm. uh, and what do we see in in the visual band? Right, that's in the in the visual wavelength. Yeah, that's what, what I mean. What what we're, you're, what we're using right now? Correct. Yeah, and then you said something fast tracking. Did you say fast tracking radar? Fast tracking cameras. I would say cameras. Fast -tracking. Why are, why are those important? Well, because these are transient, right? You know, I mean, I don't know. Uh, this this goes into a little bit more detail. I'll probably have to talk to experts on this one. Uh, if we have this is this is a problem, right? To to know how fast we want to track them, we need to have start with something, um, and and then see if we can uh, track any of these uh, objects. Maybe initially we may be uh, successful with some of the uh, some some objects to see how fast we will be. Uh, they, they are going, maybe then we can fine tune, refine our instruments. So this is how the process has to start. We have to start at some place. Right, right. And and Jacob, would these be ground-based um, observations or would you try to get, as Ravi said, this is in the atmosphere, upper atmosphere. How, how will you get up there to watch? Right, I mean, you know, ultimately it, it's, it's dependent on, you know, is there funding available and how much funding is available? So if you had unlimited funding, you would have a network of space-based monitors but you know, realistically, you know, funding is limited. You know, you'd have as a ground-based network with global coverage to the extent that you could. Um, you know, one thing in the um, the UAP task force report that you know I'm not putting like tons of faith in the government, but the government does say in the report that they're they're calling for uh, more intergovernmental cooperation to share data to. Um, to, to try to identify these. And so that kind of model is, you know, we can we can look pull from data that you know NASA satellites are taking, for example, and mm -hmm. and you know other other public uh, you know government and, and, and other non-US government sources of data that are available uh, for anyone, and then collect our own data. And like, yeah, you're gonna have to have some, you know, hire some postdocs or something to sit and pour through this data. And I mean, it's always that, that, the postdocs. It's always there the might be something that could be learned right now yeah. with without collecting too much more additional data, but really just mm -hmm. carefully comparing uh, data from multiple data sets that don't always get compared. Mm -hmm. So that might be another place to start while we're trying to collect new, new data. Mm -hmm. And have you had scientists um, contact you and say, we want to be a part of this, if we can just get the, you know, the funding and the organization together? They, I mean, we, they answered your call, in other words? I mean, I don't know that there's there's funding available that, that you know, we, we've we've seen. Um, there's there's certainly scientists who have contacted us and say they're interested uh, in, in talking about this. They agree that there shouldn't be a taboo. And I think that's probably been the most encouraging uh, result of the of the U.S. government taking a formal position on this is that that's helped to break down the taboo. Um, it's it's not there's still not mainstream scientific investigation of UAP, 
but you know, we're here talking to you. I'm not worried about my career. What's going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, 10 years ago, that might not been the case. It might've mm -hmm. been a riskier for me and Ravi to be having this conversation, which I don't like that. I think you should be able to talk about anything as scientists. It should all be open if, if you're being honest with how you're asking the questions. So, um, so it's yeah. not just taboo, it's taboo with consequences. So it's one it thing- It has for, been for some people, it, yeah. I see, I see. You know, these objects, um, this idea of, of providing some kind of global network in your in your wish list, and you should present your wish list. It's always good to hear if, you, if there were no restrictions, what anyone would want. But um, if you had to, if you had to narrow it a little bit, you know, these objects are often seen by pilots, and it's um, over water, it's over often military compounds and around airports. Is there, does that guide you? Um, in other words, is there anything about where the phenomena are spotted that would inform how you study them. I would go ahead, Jacob. You want to? I'll just you know briefly. I mean, I think commercial pilots would be one place to go because uh, it's not connected to the military at all. And so th there's been some sightings by commercial pilots. Uh, you know, maybe look at those a little bit. I don't know if there's patterns that would be even reasonable to predict. I have a hard time believing. You know, but but in any case, you could do something with you know commercial pilots or, or, or even just private planes um, flying at high altitudes is, you know, one place you could start. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think um, maybe some of the places where there have been reported uh, UAP uh, events maybe would be a good start uh, and see or talk to the people who, are, who have been involved in this before and uh, see if we can uh, have these uh, instruments near those places mm -hmm. would be a good one, good place to start. Did I characterize that right? That often it is over military um, compounds and um, over yeah, water. I, I would say that's an observational bias because that's where that's where the reports are coming from. That doesn't mean that's the only place they are going to be there. Okay. Excellent point. Uh, just to follow up on the on the pilots, and I, this is just a curiosity of mine, and I don't know if you've talked to any pilots, but um, most of these reports, um, when they are reports from Navy pilots or pilots, they're obviously reporting what they don't understand. But has anyone gotten accounts from directly from pilots who do know what they're seeing, but maybe initially they didn't know what they were seeing? They didn't know what they were seeing at first. Then they figured it out. But of course, they would never report that. You know, that would never become an incident, um, be an incident report. Has anyone, just curious, has anyone talked to pilots who have said, oh yeah, I, I saw something like that. And then I figured it out. It was a balloon or whatever it would be. <clears throat> so did I stump you? No, no. Oh, um, okay. Did anyone as in uh, either, either one of us or? No, you... but I, I'm not asking if one of you have, but I just wonder if that's also a way of going is not just what's been reported, but maybe what hasn't been reported or what has been resolved. It was just, it's just something I was thinking about um, when we we're talking about what pilots have seen. Well, I mean, that's part of what you would do in an in investigation, if especially if you were, you were trying to incorporate eyewitness accounts. You can't base, you know, it, it's very dubious to base an entire investigation on eyewitness accounts. But if you have radar and you have video and then you have eyewitness accounts, um, then you wanna to talk to those people and there's methods for how you do you know, oral interviews and understanding mm -hmm. how the story changes based on the first sighting and the retellings of that story. So, so um, yeah, presumably that would come out if, if there was a report that a pilot saw UAP and it got recorded and then you're following up on this investigation later, you would interview the pilot. And if, if they now know what it is, then a good investigation would have interviewed the pilot to, to make sure they, they get that story. So this sounds like what you're asking for is something that is quite layered. So you're using the, the instruments to collect the, collect the data, but then also talk to the eyewitnesses and then try to bring it all together to get a comprehensive understanding. Yeah, I mean, ideally, you know, you would have so many sensors that, that you wouldn't even need to talk to anybody, you know, just the way we do exoplanets that, to, to remove any ambiguity. But at least to start with, if these are transient events and we don't even know exactly where to search, and we have limited resources, you, you probably have mm -hmm. to at least, you know, take that into account 
you don't have to believe everything everybody says, but you know, there's, you know, Robert, you, you're talking about who, who needs to be involved in this. You need social scientists involved, people who understand how to conduct interviews and how to, to take oral histories and, 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 and the methodology, methodology involved in that. So can I, so I'd like to say something over here. So I, I yes, social scientists are in, involved in that probably because uh, I guess Jacob, you you mean because of the eyewitness accounts. Is that how, how to do the interviews? Yes, just, yes. I mean, that's, that's an art, just like we know how to run, you know, experiments and telescopes. Just how, how do you do an interview it is a skill that I'm not trained in. Right. So, but, but for, for an actual scientific investigation data, um, and instrumental data, let me be more clear on that. And instrumental data is the one that we, we need to make a, uh, some progress on understanding these UAPs. So, so while eyewitness accounts are really good, because that will give us an idea about what people may or may have seen, um, having an instrumental data is the one that actually mm -hmm. would help us in understanding and making uh, some sort of a uh, leaps in understanding these uh, these objects. So, so well, the reason why I, I am a little bit hesitant on that is because um, there is a social science part of this, uh, and uh, and there is an actual physical science aspect for this one. So I want. So my interest is in the physical science part of it. I know eyewitness accounts are you know where people would want to go and see if they you know verify uh, or. Uh, asks questions about, but physical data is what really matters if we want to make anything out of this. Mm -hmm. Let's um, let's step back for a little bit and look at the scientific process in general, because this is not the first scientific subject that had um, that it was once that is taboo or that was once taboo to study. <clears throat> and I wonder if you both, uh, one of you or you both, could give an example of a scientific phenomena that was once taboo, but we studied it anyway, and it yielded some important results. Are there examples of that that have slipped our minds? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'll give one is um, uh, endosymbiosis. So this is the idea that our cells uh, actually have a little mini cell inside it, the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell and then a plant, it's chloroplasts. And the hypothesis was that these were separate organisms that got swallowed up by the cell. And Lynn Margulis was one of the champions of this idea. And, and it, it was you know, basically ridiculed that that, mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense that, that a cell would, would swallow up another organism and become a dual organism cell. And, and we know this is, is correct now because we can take the DNA from mitochondria and chloroplasts and show that it's, it's unique separate DNA um, from the cell. And, and so, I mean, it completely revolutionized the way we think about evolution and, and biology. And yeah, at one point you, you, you could probably risk your job by saying that that was a research interest. Late tectonics. That's, that's incredible because that's such a, a fundamental understanding of biology now that cells have mitochondria and and that they were originally free, probably free living cells that were swallowed up by the mother cell or father cell. Um, Robbie, what were you going to say? Excuse me. No, I was saying plate tectonics is another uh, was another mm -hmm. you know type of subject. That and that's was, very recent. That's very recent. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, what, that, that was another uh, scientific topic that, that was a taboo, but, but taboo in the sense stigmatized, but it was, now we know the earth operates, the, the geophysical mechanisms of earth is based on uh, the cycling of the mantle and the uh, inner mantle, and then the crust, uh, the surface of the earth, you know, operates with the uh, plate tectonic mechanism. So if we can study those things, we need, it, because people were interested in that. So we should do a similar uh, scientific study on these uh, uh, UAPs as well. Mm -hmm. This is how we, uh, we uh, you know, we inform the general public, uh, the scientific process. This is an excellent way of teaching scientific process to uh, non-scientists. So take this opportunity. You know, so I like, you're saying I, that I like would be your, the added oh. benefit. That's the added yeah. benefit. Correct. Mm -hmm. But I like the plate tectonics example that Ravi brings up because um, it was Alfred Wegener who proposed this idea of 
continental drift. So he didn't actually know about plate tectonics, but he noticed the continents had similar shapes and there was fossil distributions that lined up if you move the continents together. And part of the reason that the hypothesis of continental drift, just continents moving, was, was rejected at, at his time was because he lacked an explanatory mechanism. And you had to wait until we discovered seafloor spreading and plate tectonics arrived. And, and then, then kind of he was vindicated retrospectively, uh, Wagner's hypothesis. And so there, there's sort of some parallels here with UAP. You know, we, I don't like to put forth a hypothesis in terms of what they are. Uh, this, the most I'll say is, I, you know, they seem to be objects and, and worth studying. But, but um, you don't have to have a full theoretical explanation for what you're studying in order to study it. We, there's there's mm -hmm. lots of examples of that in science and plate tectonics is a great one. So we could have kept studying continental drift and maybe we would have arrived at plate tectonic sooner um, mm -hmm. if we had if we'd just been a little more open-minded. Um, now you said you don't like to engage in speculation, but is it all right if I do? It's your show, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's my show, but okay. Okay, so while I was preparing for this, um, I read something in the New York Times um, that was reported in October, and it was a pretty, pretty startling, at least I thought so. The Pentagon reported that China had caught them by surprise by testing a hypersonic missile, and the Pentagon described it as China's Sputnik moment. So it wasn't a small thing, it was a big thing. The way this missile moves sounds a lot like some of these UAPs. It's described as a hypersonic missile that can change course suddenly, uh, it can zigzag, and it can move in ways that would render all US missile defenses obsolete. Now, no one in this article or the other articles that I read about this, and this was just a few weeks ago, has made the connection to the UAP report. And I'm wondering, is it possible that the answer to what these are is right in front of us? I would like to point out first that this is, again, based on the recent reports. 50 years ago, if uh, you know anyone else on this, on this planet had that kind of capability, then I would say probably 60 years ago, 50, 50 60 years ago. So while, while you know, it is certainly possible that some of these uh, objects may be from uh, other nations, we this explanation cannot be we can have we cannot have a blanket explanation for all the cases all over the world every time in the past present the recent past uh, any, any time so so yes it is possible that it could be from you know some of these could be from uh, some other countries but <laughs> It, there are just too many cases uh, to to have this explanation valid for all of them okay fair enough um, I want to remind um, people who are listening, the audience members, that you can write questions to us, and we're going to start taking questions very soon. Um, I have another one, though, before we move into audience questions. Um, Ravi and Jacob, how do you know when the study is over? Um, at some point, the Condon report, for example, in the 60s ended. At what point do you say, well, we were able to identify these objects, or we couldn't identify these objects, we can't identify all of the objects. And does that mean that we just need to accept that some things can't be explained? But the question is, when is the study over? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And you know, we have the same problem in our other research that we both do, which is we want to search exoplanets for signs of life, biosignatures or technosignatures, stuff the SETI Institute is interested in too. How do we know when we've searched enough planets to say there's no light? Like, let's say we don't find anything right away. How do we search a thousand planets or 10,000? And so, you know, there's, there's no end to when you know you've searched enough to conclude a negative answer. Um, but you can, you can have some sort of statistical sense. Like, well, if we've, if we've explained 90% of the unexplained cases and there's 10% left or 1% left, um, you, you know, there has to be a little bit of, of, of a sense of we've, we've done a statistically complete job and we found nothing uh, at this point, we're going to step back and reevaluate. But, you know, we're not there yet with exoplanets in, in, in biosignatures. We're just scratching the surface of that. We were the, the NASA, you know, the decadal survey report favorably recommended a, a exoplanet finding mission. 
that won't even get us there. That'll find 20 some planets and I'll be an old man at that point. So, <laughs> I, you know, when do we, when have we searched enough for life yeah. in the universe and exoplanets? Um, probably when people's great, great grandchildren in, in this call are old, assuming the funding continues to mount to support those kind of telescopes. So I think we'd be a long way off for UAP until we have a real data collection effort underway. Okay. So can I quickly add something on yes, that? And then we'll go to some, so you can imagine that the audience has lots of questions. Yeah, go ahead, Ravi. Yeah, so, so um, one of the things that when we found the first exoplanet, because we work in exoplanets, I'm giving the examples of exoplanet. When we found, discovered the first exoplanet, we didn't stop there. We said, okay, well, we found an exoplanet, let's go ahead. And then we understood, no, we, when we found, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of them now, now we know that the most common exoplanet is probably a mini Neptune sized planet and uh, in, in our galaxy. And, and so that's, that's, that's a statistical study. And now we are trying to find out uh, biosignatures or techno signatures in them. When we find one of them, we don't close our telescopes and go back and do something else. We, find, we want to find a distribution of life on in the universe. So I'm not, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not trying to connect this life, uh, search for life with UOBs. They are, in my view, they are totally different unless something strong comes into picture that, you know, there is some connection. So th this, is, this is why we need to do this in, in you know, we need, there is no end to this. <laughs> Well, well, there is an end to um, this discussion here. This is a, a SETI talk, of course, and we're discussing whether or not um, UAPs are um, a scientific, appropriate scientific study. Um, and we do have some questions. <clears throat> so the first question from the audience is, um, and I'm reading the questions that have been posted here. What, what is the protocol for public release if UAPs are confirmed as extraterrestrial Technology. So, if you do decide that it's extraterrestrial, how are you how are you going to break it to us? <laughs> well, so there's if if it's the U.S. government, that's that has nothing to do with us, and there's secrecy and classification and all that. But um, if if this were you know in the hands of, of private citizens and, and and just scientists doing doing work, I mean, this is analogous to again, you know, not that we're. UAPs are necessarily aliens, but finding something like the SETI Institute wants to find extraterrestrial life. How do you announce that? Um, there's been some discussions of, do you have protocols? How do you, you know, you'd certainly want to check your work before you announce something big like that. You'd maybe call up some friends and make sure they can corroborate your observations and check your calculations. And so you'd at least nominally want to have that. Um, and so, you know, there are, are some discussions and, and published protocols that aren't legally binding in any sense, but they mm -hmm. make some recommendations as to how do you, you know, responsibly disseminate the information where you certainly don't want to sit on this and keep it from people who really want to know, mm -hmm. but, but also make sure that you're not putting information out there that then you have to retract later. Um, okay, great. So there is a there is a protocol there, and I suppose if you do find something as interesting as an alien craft, you you will have a little bit of time to make sure that you let us all know in the appropriate way. We have some more questions here, and I'll just maybe ask that we'll keep the the answers sort of brief so we can we can get through these because people are so interested. Um, the next question is how much money is needed to fund a surveillance network? Maybe, maybe the ideal network that Jacob said he would like to have. What are we looking at here, ballpark? I mean, you, you know, it would probably be, you know, on the order of hundreds of millions to, you know, billion or so if you, if you really wanted to do it seriously. I mean, NASA flagship missions are billions of dollars. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the breakthrough initiatives are hundred million dollar efforts to scan the sky. So, I mean, I think, if you really want to seriously collect data in a global scale, it's going to have a big price tag like that. Okay, big price tag. <laughs> we'll just go with that. It's a big price tag. That's that's fair enough. I think we can all probably imagine. Um, this other one is a little bit more <clears throat> specific. Um, how can we train our observational systems and sensors to recognize if there are unknown craft entering or exiting the atmosphere at high velocity? Um, or exhibiting um, the observables described by the AATIP, which is the government rep report, I think. Um, how do you do that? How do you set up a, a network that is it would be able to um, um, observe if objects were entering or leaving our atmosphere? 
so there's a lot of uh, um lot of things that are uh, influxing and outfluxing <laughs> influxing into the earth atmosphere uh, so noise is a big factor here so we no, need noises to, noises right so we, and so we need to have a good um, uh, algorithms to distill out the noise and and have uh, identify the interesting ones even if you find something it may not be the one that you were looking for maybe it's something that you overlooked and so um for to, to do that we need to have a good um um analysis methods algorithms uh, that can be trained those are the machine learning and artificial intelligence all the algorithms are the probably the ones that we need to focus on developing so you'd be collecting the raw data um observing the skies and then using these algorithms to fil- filter out and th- this actually um folds into the next question is and i think you've answered this but um maybe if you don't mind summarizing again is how you would sort out the thousands of astronomical transients that happen every night um this audience member is saying that he or she goes camping and when uh, they're in a very dark area, you see meteor meteors, you see lots of things happening up there. So how do you filter out some of those, as you say, natural, I use that word in quotes, but natural phenomena? Well, well we know some of, we know some uh, nature of some of these uh, astronomical uh, transient phenomena, right? So if we have the data, maybe we can uh, rule out some portion of the data collected to by com- just by comparison with the known uh, astronomical uh, phenomena uh, characteristics and even if some of them are left over beyond that uh, they may still turn out to be the known phenomena astronomical phenomena just because they may be uh, you know having different characteristics than what uh, we have not observed before mm-hmm. so they like i said there won't be a aha moment and saying, oh, here is something that is uh, uh, totally uh, different. It, it, you will find several of them totally different, but you will, you will have to uh, carefully not, this is where our, um, uh, our um, um, what do you call, understanding of uh, the noise phenomena comes into picture. We cannot say that we found something. We can only say that these look, in, these, these look interesting. And that's where we have to stop. We cannot go do, the, do the objects look like any kind of astronomical phenomena that you either one of you are familiar with anything? You know, potential misidentification can always happen. So yes, some of them could uh, possibly look like uh, some astronomical phenomena. But then again, given uh, the kind of data, you know, if you have a spectral data, the you know wavelength data, if you have some kind of a, a movement data, maybe then we can. Uh, sort out and then filter out. Otherwise, it, they may look some similar. But I mean, when you looked at those videos, did you say, oh, God, that looks a little bit like a meteor that looks like? Uh, based on the snippets of data, the pilots have seen something and they say they see something. So I, I think uh, that is not a meteor. <laughs> um, I want to get to the other, the other questions here. But, <clears throat> you know, in your article, um, you quote Carl Sagan and you say that you, you quote him and he says, scientists are particularly bound to have open minds. That is the lifeblood of science. And that goes to the point that Rob, Ravi just made right now. In what way would this UAP study be an exemplar of the way that science is supposed to be done? And what is the role of humility in this? And that is a word that, that you used in a conversation I had with you, Jacob. So, so what would this mean in terms of being a demonstration of the best of, of a scientific endeavor. Sure, yeah, you know, as, as scientists, we don't become scientists because we know everything. And I think some scientists forget that, that we're, we're, we don't know everything and therefore we're scientists. We're actually scientists because we don't know so much about the universe and because we want to know, that's why we're scientists. And so if there's something that we don't know what it is, it's anomalous, anomalous, it's, it's an object in the sky, we don't know what it is, um, that should be something that gets scientists excited. Maybe not every single scientist, but enough of them because it's something we don't understand. And mm-hmm. so I think, I think you know, there's, there's sort of a, a humility that needs to be at the core of what drives us as scientists that we don't know. And we're actually always trying to prove our models and our hypotheses wrong to learn more. And we don't want to just, we're not trying to arrive at the top of the mountain and say, all right, I figured it all out now. 
we're, we're you know, that, that there's, there's, I think this, this hubris kind of can infect science a little bit too much. And we definitely need more humility mm -hmm. in terms of just realizing that we really don't know a lot about the universe still. I, I'd, I'd like to offer a counterpoint on that. Scientists are, you know, understandably uh, skeptical and conservative because it needs a rigorous analysis and rigorous testing. That is how the, everything we know now, uh, we have now, is uh, because of the scientific methodology we have you know, uh, you know, followed through. But the, it has its drawbacks. Process takes time, so some things may get delayed. But in the end, the thing that stands of all these tests will remain as the solid uh, explanation for something. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the process is difficult, the process is skeptical, the process is conservative, but it works. The processes also include publishing. And that sure. brings me to the next question that um, uh, an audience member has, which is, will you publish the study? And will you publish it in something called uh, a UAP journal? Will there be a journal like that? <clears throat> and will these, these be peer reviewed? Yes. I think that is that that is publishing is one thing that has to happen, and because that's where we can share the data, people can uh, you know the our colleagues can criticize it. That's good for science, uh, and then you know may poke holes in our analysis. That's again good because then we will refine it and see what we have our own. Uh, you know, not, not we as, as not in just uh, Jacob and I, but in general uh, the people who publish. So it is uh, it will it need to be published because. Uh, we can share the data, we can share the results and people can test it. Okay, and there's another one. Thank you for that. I just, uh, there's a scrolling, there's a lot of questions here and they're scrolling by pretty fast. Um, <clears throat> this next question is, is, is about funding um, again and where, this is a little bit different from how much, but the question is where would the funding come from? Presumably from uh, private uh, philanthropists. I, I, you know, if the U.S. government agencies are interested in funding this, uh, I mean, I'm not seeing any any indication of that just yet. So presumably, this would be private uh, funding. Okay, private funding, and um, <clears throat> are you willing to? Okay, let's let me ask this then. If um, if of all the possible conclusions of the nature of these of these objects, what result would be the most scientifically important and personally exciting to you? And this this may be our last. There's one other question I'm going to ask you about how the public can get involved, but this may require some speculation. And I know Ravi was saying you want to be very careful about that. <laughs> but if you could just now um, share with us what would be the most scientifically important and what would actually personally be very, very exciting. And I know balloons is one of them because I know you got very excited by the idea that there's 400 different kinds of balloons. Um, but what else might it be? I would defer this to Jacob. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, yeah, I think you, you're required to answer this. Um, I have to be careful here because um, um, I try to avoid this kind of speculations and I, anything that follows a scientific method and then whatever comes out of it would, I would have, I would rest and I would be more, uh, comfortable trusting that results and I would be more excited about that because then I know I'm excited for the right reasons. Okay, so it sounds like what would excite, <laughs> excite you um, is to have an answer and to sure. feel like you had gone through the method, the appropriate, the, the method of science and it was a rigorous study and you came up with some conclusion at the end. Correct. Okay, and you wouldn't be just a little excited if it were aliens, a little bit? Um, little bit is an understatement. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So he's revealing that. Jacob, how about you? Scientifically important and uh, maybe just personally would be very exciting. Sure. Well, one, one of the things that drew me to this topic is the fact that it's a taboo. It, it's because as a scientist, that really irks just my core sensibilities of like, you know, you can't tell me that I'm not allowed to study something if I think it's interesting. And so in that sense, having this conversation and writing, you know, articles, uh, 
is 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 encouraging for me and i would be in that sense happy if you know 10 or 20 years from now you, you could be a professor and uap is one of your research portfolio items and nobody blinks twice at it and there's funding available for it even, even if it's an ongoing inquiry at that point i would be really excited that you know we were a small part of bringing a field into the mainstream from the fringes and, and acknowledging that there's something mm -hmm. interesting. So I would be really happy about that. But I will say, um, if if there's really if, if you know what we see not just from the Navy videos, but uh, you know observations that have been reported over time, if there's really unknown physics that we don't understand, I would be really excited to learn something really <laughs> new about physics, something that that challenges what we learned in, in our college physics classes and and forces us to reconceptualize you know, our technology. And I don't I don't even care what the source is. Like I'm an astrobiologist. Of course I'd be excited about finding aliens, just you know, even on an exoplanet. But but in terms of what UAP are, even if it's totally decoupled from anything extraterrestrial, mm -hmm. but it teaches us new physics, that would be really cool. So if it's on the uh, like in the ballpark of something like dark energy or dark matter or something like that, sure, I mean, the, that would the, be the cool. finding of dark energy, that's actually quite decent. Anything. It's, it's something we don't understand. If, and then if it's mundane, if it's something that they're all balloons, but for some reason they all got misclassified. Well, that seems important. That might even be like a safety risk or, or you, know, so, you know, national defense. If we're misidentifying that many mundane objects, we, we, there was still something we didn't know. Yeah. We do have time for a few more questions, but that, that is one of them. Um, do you think that these objects uh, pose a risk to people, to um, aircraft? Yeah, it is a safety issue. Um, there is a safety issue. Because, because, you know, we hear from pilots who have reported, we don't somehow, if this is a stigmatized topic and a ta taboo, we don't hear from, uh, you know, several others. So lack of, this is a classic example of uh, absence of evidence is not an evidence of absence. Mm -hmm. You know, Jacob, um, you said that you would not be, I'm paraphrasing, so I don't know if I have this exactly right, but you would not be disappointed if it weren't aliens, if it were some other um, physical phenomena, that would be terrific. But let's say that, um, that they are alien craft, would that, make you feel as though your work in SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, had, had been for nothing. That's a question from one of our listeners, that listening for these signals in the end was all for naught because they were here visiting us all the, you know, Oh, you know, that, that is a great question. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, my interest in SETI is not just in listening for radio signals um, for exoplanets. I mean, I'll make this quick, but, you know, we should look for atmospheric pollution and other things, not just radio signals. But there's also other things we can look for in SETI. We've sent the Voyager and Pioneer spacecraft outside our solar system. We're planning to send probes to nearby star systems. There's no reason extraterrestrials couldn't send spacecraft into our solar system. And so we, you know, we call that solar system SETI. And so the idea that there could be extraterrestrial artifacts flying around the solar system, whether they're broken or not, that's, to that's something I've been interested in for a while. And, and I think that's, that's something we should continue to study. So the connection I think that a lot of people may have in mind is that if you have a free floating craft in the solar system that's of alien origin and it enters Earth's atmosphere, now it's a UAP. And I'm not sure, I haven't seen any evidence myself to, to connect the two, to connect the UAP that have been observed over time with this idea of solar system SETI. But I acknowledge the fact that hypothetically, if there were a spacecraft, alien spacecraft flying through the space, it would be of interest to SETI up until the moment it enters the atmosphere. And now it's called a UAP. And because of the stigma, we can't steady it. And so that particular scenario, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's what we have seen yet. But, but you have to keep an open mind in that sense that, that if, if you can't, if once, because it's stigmatized, it just creates this problem where, you know, in, in that one, hypothetical said he would miss the thing it's trying to find. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, if we found that they were extraterrestrial, um, no, I would be excited then because it would tell me that that there is a connection between solar system SETI and UAP. Mm -hmm. I don't see the connection now, but I would be excited to find that there was a connection. Mm -hmm. So they're not mutually exclusive. Um, you know, pilots have a, a great view, of course, 
Uh, but one of the audience members writes in, what about the, um, the astronauts on the International Space Station? Has anyone contacted them and wondered what their eyes in the sky might tell us? Not, not that I'm, I'm aware of. No, okay. All right, well, the final question then, you gave us the big picture question of what you would like this to be and what you personally would get excited about. Um, nice to know that Ravi would get excited about um, alien craft. Uh, what, can, um, what can the public do? And is there anything that uh, someone writes, anything that the regular folks can do uh, to contribute to the efforts around UAP research? Well, there's, uh, you know, bills in the Senate right now. Um, and, and, you know, I think Congress is generally interested in this. So I think that's something you can do is just write to your Congress people, tell them that you're interested in this. Um, I would say, you know, try to decouple it from the, the, the pseudoscience and, and from the, you know, just fo focus on, on what we've been talking about here, that there's a need for further scientific investigation. And I think the more Congress hears from people that they care about this, and 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 it's in a you know coherent, rational, scientific argument. I think I think that'll only help. Lovely. Well, Jacob and Ravi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It went by so fast um, for this SETI talk discussing whether or not UAP should be investigated scientifically. I think you made a very good case that they should be. Um, I'll turn things over to Bill now. Great, thank you, Molly, and thank you, Jacob, and thank you, Ravi. That was uh, really fascinating. Uh, I think some some you know great topics um, emerge from this conversation. First and foremost, the need for you know a rigorous scientific approach to answer this question and and to you know separate it um, and and uh, uh, differentiate it from sort of the pseudoscience that that has dominated the topic. I thought it was also very interesting that you cited these um, really important examples of plate tectonics and also the phenomena of mitochondria in cellular biology as being topics that were previously thought to be, or, or ideas that were previously thought to be absolutely absurd and now are, are you know, accepted as, as mainstream science and, and scientifically backed knowledge. It's also interesting that um, UAP uh, as a phenomena, I mean, that, that as a phenomena, I, I think, although perhaps people um, even much longer ago than 50 or 60 years had seen things in the sky they couldn't really understand, I think it's fair to say that the sort of UFO UAP phenomena has been something um, uh, in the public conscious for about 50 or 60 years, I guess since the late 1940s. Um, and yet one of the things that, that separates uh, our time now from that period then is we do actually have the tools and technologies to do rigorous uh, scientific inquiry on this subject. And it's a little bit like SETI, although I think in SETI, it's probably fair to say that people for thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years have looked up in the sky and wondered, are we alone? Uh, but what makes this time unique is our ability to answer that question because we have the tools and technologies to address it. So uh, I think these are, are, are fascinating points. As I said in my, my opening remarks, you know, I do think that um, uh, there's, you know, I would certainly support and, and, and accept the funding for undertaking a, a program where we can apply some of the tools and techniques, things, for example, like our CAMS meteor detection camera system, which is a worldwide network of camera systems always looking up um, that could be repurposed in some format to, uh, to do this kind of, uh, of work, at least in the optical domain. So there, there is lots of, lots of uh, room and I think lots of opportunity here. Sorry, I don't know if somebody was also trying to say something just then, but if not, um, in any case, I do want to, again, thank you, Molly and, and Jacob um, and, uh, and Robbie. And also I wanna thank you uh, in our audience for your great questions. And of course, like always, we never really have time to address them all, um, but I, I hope we address some of the ones that you thought were, were particularly interesting. I do wanna point out again that as always, we, we reached a really global audience this evening and. And I think that just proves again that curiosity truly does unite us all as human beings, regardless of our language, our gender, our race, or our ethnicity, we, we share this common curiosity. In the United States, we had people from Virginia, Hawaii, Colorado, Arizona, Michigan, Minnesota, California, Texas, Alabama, Rhode Island, Illinois, New York, Oregon, Georgia, Utah, Arizona, Washington, Missouri, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, 
Nevada, Massachusetts, Alaska, and Ohio. And internationally, we had uh, folks and friends with us from Mexico, Canada, Peru, Colombia, Italy, India, Australia, Ecuador, Norway, the UK, Panama, and Argentina. So how wonderful to have such a global audience with us tonight, and thank you all for joining us. So before closing, let me just remind you that SETI Talks is a production of the SETI Institute. We are in Mountain View, California. We are a nonprofit research and education institution, and our mission is to lead humanity's quest to understand the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe and to share that knowledge to inspire and guide present and future generations. This SETI Talks lecture series is supported in part by donations from the public, from friends of science like you. We bring these lectures and other events to you at no cost, but we're very grateful for any and all donations that allow us to continue bringing the stories of extraordinary science and exploration to you. So you can join our community. You can be part of our quest. Visit SETI.org for more information. You can make a donation if you're so inclined. Sign up for our monthly science newsletter we call Journey, which is full of all kinds of uh, wonderful stories. I think, in fact, we are now putting that out weekly. So there's all kinds of news coming at you all the time. So thanks again to all of you for being with us today. And thanks to tonight's moderator, Molly Bentley, and our guest speakers, Jacob and Ravi. Thanks as well to our sponsor, Carl Cruz, for funding this conversation on UAPs. And of course, I want to thank Rebecca, Frank, Lee, Simon, Beth, Jasmine, and the rest of the team at the SETI Institute who make the SETI Talk series possible. Don't forget to visit our YouTube channel and tour the amazing array of lectures, presentations, and other videos. And tonight's talk will be among those in the coming days. And if you're interested in sponsoring a SETI Talks event, get in touch with us. Our email address is info at SETI.org. And remember that the work we do at the SETI Institute is for all of us, for all of humankind. So don't just stand by and watch. You can come and join us at SETI.org and get involved. The search for life beyond Earth is a journey of ultimate discovery, and we invite you to come along. So thanks again for being with us tonight.